Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Product Launch Podcast. As always, I'm the host, Sean Boyce from Next Step. Today, I'd like to introduce you a friend of mine and the founder and managing director of AND Marketing, and Raj Kapoor. How, hi, Raj. How are you? And thank you for being on the show. Uh, doing great. Thanks, Sean. How are you? Doing very well. I'm looking forward to learning much more about marketing on this episode, not just myself, but my listeners as well. So for those of us that don't know, uh, I'd love to hear it again as well. Also, can you give us an idea what AND Marketing is and how it came to be? Yeah, sure thing. So uh, AND Marketing, a company with a silly name, was, was sort of born out of uh, my personal experience. So to take a step back, I've got about uh, 20 years uh, overall experience and a, lot, a vast majority of that is with really big companies. And so I did some sales, I did some strategy, and I did a whole lot of marketing and product marketing and uh, product management type of roles at big companies like GE and General Mills. Uh, then I became a strategy consultant for about five years before um, I left and started in marketing. In that strategy role, we did a lot of marketing and uh, marketing strategy and product management type of work for Fortune 100 companies. And when I decided to leave that, I wasn't really looking to start a marketing company per se, uh, but what I found was a huge opportunity uh, to take my sort of big company strategy and work and apply it to smaller company situations. And over the past three years, what that's basically turned into is that we are the outsourced marketing department for growing companies, small and growing companies that know they need a really diverse skill set, but can't necessarily hire a whole marketing department. So it's somewhere between strategy and execution. We found this sort of sweet spot. And so that's what we act as. So that's why we call it and marketing is because you do whatever you do really well and we handle the marketing. Yeah, I think that's a great way to think about it. I mean, marketing is so important. I talk about this all the time. I get involved a little bit. You mentioned product management experience, which I imagine also comes in handy with the people that you're helping from time to time. But product management experience is something I obviously know very well and something that is critical when helping people build and grow SaaS businesses. But uh, it's our responsibility kind of as product managers to know a little bit about uh, a few different things, marketing being one of them, but leaving the rest of like the heavy lifting to experts like yourself. So I'd be curious to hear from you and your experience, the customers and clients that you've helped, right? What is the best, what is among the, some of the best kind of marketing advice you would have for those of us out there trying to build and grow SaaS businesses? Yeah, so I get to work with a lot of SaaS, uh, B2B and B2B SaaS types of companies. Um, so I think, I think that probably two or three most important things and the biggest mistakes I see people making uh, are really the fundamentals. So number one is uh, real clarity on strategy. Uh, I run into people who don't really know who their uh, prospects or their customers are and don't really understand what value their product brings. And that may sound, Sean, somebody with your level of experience, that may sound really basic, but it's amazing to me that they build a product, build a SaaS product that they think is a good you know, widget, as we like to call it, but it actually doesn't solve a problem or they don't understand how to get that information about their product in front of the right decision maker. So I'd start and I'd say number one is really getting clarity on your target. What is their problem? What is your solution to it? And how do you find them? Uh, I'd say the second big bucket is probably around messaging. And so uh, what, what tends to happen, again, with B2B SaaS types of companies is that uh, there's a lot of technical jargon and a lot of technical solutions, but the decision maker in that company that you're trying to get to buy your product or try your product or whatever uh, may not be as technical. So bringing that language into their parlance and in their word and into their words is not really as an easy activity for a lot of people. So if you're really technically oriented, sometimes you can't do that. And sometimes you need some help. So really messaging it and branding yourself a certain way uh, is probably the second one. Uh, and then the third one I would probably say is really taking the concept of the MVP, so the minimally viable product, and, and taking a commercial spin on that. So trying a whole bunch of different things as fast as you can, as inexpensively as you can, to see what is going to get the attention of that decision maker and what is not. Because what um, you know, a lot of people try to talk about is formulas that work repeatedly and repeatedly. And what I found is every business is so different, every decision maker is so different, and the world is always changing. You have to have a willingness to try a bunch of different things to see what works, what doesn't, what's expensive, what's not. So really taking the MVP mentality that the SaaS world knows so well and applying it in a commercial sense, I'd say is probably the third one. 
Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. I love <laughs> the fact that you laid it out in a very straightforward way, but you started with something that we often start with, which we feel is above and beyond kind of the most important thing when we're talking about being successful in the SaaS business or really any business, and that's the problem that we solve. So I'm curious to hear a little bit more from you on that as far as like, how do you, do you look to qualify that from the people that you work with? And if so, how do you do it? Like, well, how will you ultimately be figuring out whether or not they have, they have a better understanding of the problem that they solve? Like, what does your process look like? For, yeah. for those of us listening that have SaaS businesses that want to know, you know, are we in this category? Would we be ready for you kind of thing? How would we test ourselves to know whether or not we have that level of knowledge at this point? Yeah, well, I think any business of any size probably wants to revisit this every now and then. So uh, understanding your, your prospect or your customer's problems, there's really no substitute for research. And research can, can be done in a myriad of different ways. And there's cheap research, and there's expensive research, and there's formal research, and there's informal research. But really getting inside the mind of that person in their world and figuring out what are their day-to-day -day challenges. Quite often, I'll find, again, SaaS companies trying to solve a problem that isn't that important to that decision maker. So, yeah, I have a whole slew of problems as a business owner, for example, but I'm not necessarily willing to pay for solutions to all of those problems. I'll admit that it's a problem. That's a very common one. So if it's a, if it's a lower end of the hierarchy of, of problems that you have, you're probably not going to sleep. Uh, you know, what, what we say in the marketing world is what keeps you up at night? And so really understanding what that decision maker is and what keeps them up at night by really interviewing them. I had somebody uh, in my network who was trying to uh, get a similar business off the ground and they were targeting small businesses. And this individual literally walked up and down the street, literally the street, not even the digital street, and went into small businesses with things like cookies and little gifts and just used that as an opportunity to ask them questions about their business and how it might relate uh, to their solution. And what they finally ended up hearing was a few themes that they ended up turning into their business. That's a really natural, inexpensive, but time consuming way to go do that type of work. It also helps with the second part that I'll add to that, Sean, is the concept of competition. So what I'll hear a lot of SaaS people talking about is a very small box of competitors. So they'll say there's two or three big competitors in this space. They're here and here, and here's how we're better. Well, that doesn't take into account non-traditional competitors. So in the marketing strategy world, we spend a lot of time talking about substitutes and the impact of doing nothing. Meaning if your decision maker is perfectly fine doing nothing or using an Excel spreadsheet, you need to build a really compelling story for them to change that behavior. And quite often they don't think about the competitor do nothing. So just a couple thoughts around that whole concept of product market fit, which is something I know you're a big fan of and you talk a lot about, and I think is pretty fundamental to the way these businesses might think. Absolutely. And I really like the examples that you gave are excellent, right? There's whatever you can do to get the right types of conversations to understand the problem space from, like you said, the right people, right? Those decision makers, the problems that you have, like you said, there's plenty out there, making sure you're solving the right problem or the most important critical problem, like the critical need today is huge. Because if there's a list of 10 problems, and you're solving problem number seven, you're going to have a lot more trouble like trying to gain momentum than if you're starting with problem number one or problem number two. So I'll, I'll give you something. I'm sorry great. to interrupt. Yeah, I'll give you a couple things to steal. Your listeners can absolutely steal. My two favorite questions to ask while you're talking to somebody, it sort of uh, makes it less formal and maybe is a little disarming. Uh, number one is the one everybody already knows, and I already mentioned it. What keeps you up at night, right? So literally envisioning that person say, what keeps you up at night? And, or what bothers you in, you know, in a shower? Those types of questions get a sense of what is this person thinking about what really bugs them? Those are the ones that they're probably likely to pay to solve. The other one is what I call the magic wand question. And so I like to end research projects or, or questions with that. And I'd like to say something like, if I gave you a magic wand and you could change one thing about your business or your software or your whatever, I'm, whatever the context I'm talking about, if I gave you a magic wand and you could change one thing immediately, what would you change? And what ends up happening is it, create, it forces that decision maker who may be uncomfortable or not that forthcoming to really say, oh, I have a magic wand, now I do this. And of, of course the magic wand may or may not work, but it gives you insight into how this person thinks. So there's a couple ideas that people can steal as they're going through and trying to get some information about their prospects or their customers. Excellent options. I use the magic wand, wand question fairly regularly. Yeah. Uh, I like the keeps you up at night because that really helps you 
figure out the priority of what needs to be solved. That's always so important. There's always plenty of problems, but you want to get out of this. I call it the friends and family effect. Like you don't want to necessarily chase something that you think is a good idea, but for which there isn't serious motivation to solve it. And you had mentioned then your previous example as well too, is the power of substitutes, right? Talking like almost like a Porter's five forces component to evaluating your competition, right? Like, can you, what, you know, what are you trying to do to solve that problem? Now, I always tell the example of uh, TurboTax when they were building the software, they always talk about the fact that everyone thinks they were competing with a bunch of other digital options. In reality, they were competing against pen and paper because that's how everybody was doing it at the time. So they didn't need to be better than other pieces of software. They need to be better than pen and paper. So yeah, make sure you understand the problem space well. I love it. I just, I just heard a podcast with the founder of Eventbrite. And Eventbrite said that everybody assumed when we built our business that our competitor was Ticketmaster because they did tickets to events. But actually Eventbrite's competitor was do nothing or use Facebook or you know, use these other types of tools that existed in the world but didn't make it easy for group, groups to... Uh, to uh, get together and, and do types of events. I think it's, those are, those, yeah, that's a phenomenally good example. I love it, Sean. Awesome. I think the, uh, the other thing that I think is helpful with what you've shared thus far is to kind of break this misconception. I'd love to get your take on this because this is how I've understood it with the way some people think about marketing. As in like, I have something I think is worth selling kind of a thing. But if I haven't addressed the right problem, right, I may think that I could come to someone like yourself and that you can instead make up for the fact that I haven't addressed a critical need in the space. So kind of like a misunderstanding of, you know, using that tool and the service kind of the wrong way. So I'd love to get your thoughts around that. hundred percent. I mean, I could not agree uh, anymore because what we'll find is people uh, who come to us that have sort of already figured it out. Um, if they're not willing to take a step back and go back to those fundamentals, it ends up being pretty difficult. Um, I've had multiple clients in my three-year journey here who have said, uh, yeah, we've got the strategy down. Let's just jump straight to execution. And uh, maybe naively, what I've learned the hard way is that if you don't at least have the fundamental strategic work documented, it always comes back to that. Because I can, I'll just make it up. I can create a LinkedIn program, an email marketing program, a content program, uh, or, or 15 other different things. Um, but if that strategy work is unclear, not that the best stuff in the world won't matter. Or uh, maybe what's even worse is really good marketing will get people to make you aware of your product and they still won't buy or they will buy and be extremely dissatisfied. So marketing is only a way to build awareness when you've got that fundamental understanding of that decision maker. And I always say that's the more important part of marketing anyway. It's the information that you have rather than the tactics that you accomplish. Excellent. Couldn't have said it better myself. That makes you the expert. <laughs> Nicely done. So uh, shifting gears a little bit here, I want to talk a little bit more about the work that you guys do, how you're able to help people and pull from your expertise there as well too. So after these things have been kind of figured out and you're ready to kind of build momentum in the right direction, right? We've raised awareness with regard to make sure that you're heading in the right direction, solving the right problem kind of a thing. I'd like to hear from you from the perspective of a lot of questions that I hear a lot, people that are trying to successfully build SaaS businesses around, you know, what type of marketing channels should I be electing for helping grow my B2B SaaS business uh, or the like? i would be interested to get your kind of take there as far as like how you would respond to a question like that. Yeah, so, so the answer is obviously it depends. Depends on the business, depends on the decision maker, depends on where they hang out. So let's assume that this is a white collar B2B type of a decision maker, right? What do we know about those people here in the new decade in 2020? Those people are generally difficult to get to. They hate spam. Uh, they actually build walls around themselves, either through spam filters, administrative assistance, or other things like that to filter salespeople out. I mean, I think I just saw a software out there that can help uh, filter out sales emails, right? right? That's exactly a nightmare uh, for a lot of companies who want to grow their types of grow their types of business. Um, what I would say is. In general today, there's three or four super tried and true tools. Uh, I think the first one is content, right? So we talk a lot about video content. We talk a lot about written content. Obviously, you and I are doing a podcast right now. Uh, there's a, there's a, this humongous explosion of content. Um, however, there is still a humongous untapped market for really good content that talks about these problems. And so there's really two aspects to that uh, that, that I like to talk about. The first is the importance of uh, using the right keywords in your content. 
there is no substitute for really good keyword research. There's a lot of free tools out there. You know, obviously a company like mine can do really good research on what keywords you should be targeting. And there's a lot of advanced analytics and tools that can help you do that. What that generally helps with is helps focus your messaging on the things people are searching for, right? The reason is the reason we all go to Google a thousand times a day for everything from a pizza shop to a software that we want to buy is that we know when we Google something, we're very likely to see uh, something that, that solves our problem pretty quickly in one of those first few results. And the old fashioned way uh, of trying to keyword stack or do these sort of illicit tactics really don't work anymore. Google's getting really smart. So I always would start with really good research. And then the second part is just really good, compelling writing, right? So writing it in a compelling way, listicles are popular, case studies are popular, profiles are popular, points of view are popular. So we're very successful building out these content programs. So I think that's number one. Uh, number two is I think probably email marketing. And it's a little bit shocking or surprising for people to hear that in 2020 or beyond, email marketing is popular. And I cannot um, convince people enough that it is still a great tactic. Now, don't be a spammer. So don't buy a bunch of people's email addresses and spam them with information or be overly salesy. But once you have opted in, uh, to receive an email from somebody, you want to hear from them. It acts as an extremely good reminder. Everybody still checks their email, if not 100 times a day, at least once a day. So for you to provide valuable information for that B2B decision maker's inbox is still probably the best way to cut through. Obviously, you have to be able to unsubscribe. You should write those emails really well. Uh, one tip we realized for our business, which is really impactful, is that you know you can have a really good email, the subject line is good and the from is important, that'll get people into your content, but to actually have them click through, there's, there's um, I can't give enough uh, um, a credit to writing a really good email with a really good visual. That visual impact is really important. We still get bad emails sent to us. Uh, we've had clients that have come to like really sloppy sort of uh, layouts and things like that, and it directly impacts uh, the click through rate for whatever content you're looking um, then the third tool I think is uh, pretty much unbeatable today, and Sean, you're a pro at this, is LinkedIn. So LinkedIn has done a phenomenally good job of becoming the place where people can sort of have their virtual water cooler, share articles and, for, and information. And uh, one bonus tip I'll give to, the, uh, to give to your listeners is really around LinkedIn retargeting. LinkedIn has done a great job of finding decision makers either by their title, their industry, their geography, and you can actually promote your information in front of them even without them having um, your con even without them having awareness of your business. So there are ways to do that. LinkedIn has started to improve those and we have seen some real breakthrough results. Yeah, those are some serious options, but you've broken it down for us really well, I would say. Thanks for the nod about LinkedIn. Uh, I can't say enough good things about using that tool. In particular, the sales navigator form of search is excellent. I love being able to get hyper, you know, as specific as I can get and, you know, breaking that notion of trying to hit a very wide audience. The more specific I go, the more consistent my messaging gets, the better the conversations are that I have, and I get a better understanding of, you know, the people who I want to speak with and their concerns and what I may be able to help them with. So couldn't agree more about that plug content as well. Also, uh, I've learned that firsthand as well, right? Make sure you write well, make sure you write things that are compelling and value. Like you mentioned, like the podcast that we're doing right now, that kind of stuff is great. Um, and you know, added benefit to the, the podcast for, that has been for me thus far, not only does it give me the ability to kind of stay in touch with great people in my network like you, Raj, that, you know, have expertise to share with a wide variety of audience members that, you know, I'm connected to both um, personally or that find the show and ultimately subscribe. But it, it ends up being a great hook, right? It's, it, it, it ends up being a great way to start a conversation with someone, to build a relationship with them. And as we know, right, relationships are so important in being successful, kind of regardless of the business. Um, plus, you've got a built-in way to kind of market the audience. And I'm sure you would appreciate that as well too, right? It's like, I have someone to help me share the show to reach a wider array of like listeners and get traction. Yeah, yeah, you nailed it. Excellent. Um, so one of the other questions I have for you is one that I get all the time as well too, is, and I'm sure it's something that crosses your desk constantly. Right? People want to know how they can get more leads. Everybody that has some form of a B2B SaaS business, they want to know how to get from where they are to that next level, whatever that next level may be, right? 10,000 MRR, 100,000 MRR, millionaire or whatever kind of a thing. Um, what is what are the best advice that you have for someone that's trying to drive leads, which will ultimately you know, be the growth that they're looking for for their SaaS business? 
Yeah, I would say once you've got the strategy set, I'll always go back to that strategic fundamental. Um, we sort of have a package that we designed exactly for this. And I call it uh, two posts and an email, right? So literally every single month have the rigor to be pumping out at least two posts, like some businesses are 10 posts, bigger businesses are even more than that, right? So to have unique, compelling content that goes out on a regular basis, right? I recommend once or twice, I'm sorry, at least twice a month, if not once a week, having a new piece of content come out. It doesn't have to be you know, a giant piece of content. It could be as simple as a blog post or a case study, but develop that rigor, that's answer number one. And then number two, is getting that content distributed to your decision makers. So if you have a good email list that's in the hundreds, if not thousands of people, use an email once a month to take that content and get it in front of them. If you build it, it they will not come, right? The way that content works today is that there's zillions of websites out there. So just by creating that good content and leaving it there is probably not gonna be enough. You need a mechanism to do that. And then you obviously have to use social as well. So maybe a third one I would put in there is using social media to distribute that content in front of you. And if you keep doing that over time, um, those, those are the kind of activities that'll work. If you wanna pour gasoline on that fire, you can certainly pay to do that as well, right? So paid, uh, paid LinkedIn uh, is, a, is a huge tactic that we use on a regular basis. We use Google Ads on a regular basis. Um, those, are, those are the ways that you're gonna get in front of those decision makers who have problems that you can solve. So you heard it here first, folks, get to work. <laughs> get your marching orders. <laughs> But that's uh, the strategy is super helpful because it's easy to get lost into sea of, a sea of options and then constantly be jumping around. I think what a lot of people need, I know I did when I was starting out for you know my SaaS business, it's needed a strategy that I knew could generate some form of effective results for me that I can stick with it, be consistent with it, and then measure results over time. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll give you one more. Like th there's also an element of uh, discipline um, or prioritization, depending on which angle you want to take it. And a lot of growing companies, and you know, I was a, I was a founder, a single founder, small company owner, you're going a million miles an hour. And so to just quote unquote, say, I'm going to do two blogs a month is super easy to say, but when your to-do list is 75 things deep, that is the type of thing that always gets forced to the bottom of your list. And I'll get to it. I'll get to it. I'll get to it. So building systems and processes where you make that a regular part of your day, your week, your month, is super, super important. We have found, you know, we, I like to say we have two types of clients. One of, one of our clients doesn't know what to do. They say, I don't understand how marketing works and I need help. And that's great. The interesting one here is we have a lot of clients that know exactly what to do. They're naturally good marketers. They understand how this process works and they just need somebody else to do it, right? Because they don't have that rigor. They're busy running a business. They're a specialist in something else. They've got, you know, that big to-do list. So the other thing is building a system or rigor in place, getting a contractor, hiring a company maybe like myself to go and help you actually get that part of it done so you know it's being done. Yeah, it's excellent. And I'm sure you've got customers that you've probably taken from one to the other, right? As they learn from you, then it just becomes a, okay, I know you've got it kind of covered and under control. You helped educate us on how to do this the right way. Now we are you know, comfortable with you being in control, bringing us the results we're looking for. Yeah, absolutely. That's the goal. Yeah, that's the goal. We love to educate our customers and we can make them smarter and successful. Absolutely. Excellent. Uh, well, this content has been super helpful. Thank you very much for being here, Raj. I appreciate that. I've got two other questions for you before I let you go. The first one is, what resources would you share with myself and our audience related to these topics? Right? Give me books, blogs, events, whatever you may have for us. Um, I'm all ears. Yeah, I've got a, I've got a um, uh, one book recommendation that's been super popular that many of you are uh, followers may have seen, but if you haven't, it's uh, it's a book by Donald Miller called Building a Story Brand. And basically what Donald Miller did, he's a, he's a genius marketer because uh, he uses a framework called the hero's journey, which is extremely famous in uh, novels and movie making. And he applies it to the business world. And his concept of having to be a guide in your customer's journey uh, is, is really profound. It's not, you know, it's, again, it's not new. It's just his application of it is really good. So taking something like that allows you to humanize your messaging in a really compelling way. So again, that's Building a Story Brand by Donald Miller. I recommend uh, people pick that up if they haven't. We, we, we're one of the companies that helps companies do the story brand framework. Um, and we're just really big fans of that methodology. Uh, a couple of other ones that uh, I, you know, I'd be happy to share and I'll give a little uh, plug for 
is we're doing a marketing planning and execution webinar uh, that's completely free on March 12th, so here in a couple of weeks. And uh, I, can, I can provide you the link, Sean, to share, share with your uh, listeners, but that is basically an hour where we go in a little bit more detail about the importance of uh, driving execution when it comes to your marketing. What are some modern things? We'll go a little bit deeper than we did uh, today, and I'll have a couple of colleagues on the line with me. Uh, the other one I'll offer is what I call an IMA, and that's an initial marketing analysis. And what we do for any one of your listeners, again, we usually charge for this type of thing, but we're happy to do it uh, for free. Uh, but it's a, it's a pretty high level view of your website, your SEO, your content, your social media, and a few other areas like your site speed that will help us determine where are your goals, where are you headed, and where might you prioritize your limited resources. Because a lot of growing companies are faced with limited, uh, every company is faced with limited resources, but that may be a little bit more important. So what this does, again, it's free, is uh, within about a week or two, we can, we can turn around some recommendations on where you might prioritize some efforts to, make, to get the best, uh, biggest bang for your buck. So we're happy to do those couple of things. That's excellent. I can't thank you enough for making that offer and extending it, and I would encourage everybody to take advantage of it. Um, Raj has done something similar for my businesses, and I can't tell you how valuable it was. We still refer back to it and the insights that we learned from it. So I'd highly recommend it. Thank you for that as an offer. And great resources as well. I'll link to all of those, including the webinar, so that uh, the listeners can, can track that stuff down as well. Also, uh, last question I have for you, Raj, is who should reach out to you and how can they get in touch? Great. Well, again, uh, uh, happy, to, happy to have a conversation with anybody that's in your network, Sean. You've been a great, uh, a great friend and a great connector. So your listeners are welcome to go to and Marketing. Uh, so the website is and-marketing.com, and-marketing.com. Uh, you can find us on LinkedIn. Uh, again, my name is Raj Kapoor. You can find me on LinkedIn and uh, happy, to, happy to chat with people on any of those mechanisms. And uh, I appreciate you having me on, Sean. For sure. Thank you so much for being here, Raj, and sharing your insights with us. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Product Launch Podcast powered by Next Step. If you or anyone you know is involved in scaling a B2B SaaS business, please have them reach out to me about becoming a potential guest on our show. They can email me at sean at nextstep.io. That's S-E-A-N at N-X-T-S-T-E-P dot I-O. At this time, we'd like to take a moment to thank the sponsor of our show, Next Step Consulting. Would you like to know what the right next steps are for your B2B SaaS business? Are you trying to grow and scale, but you're stuck? We can help. To find out how Next Step can help your B2B SaaS business achieve its goals, please email me, sean at nextstep.io. That's S-E-A-N at N-X-T-S-T-E-P dot I-O. Thanks and keep disrupting.